Welcome back to Bio 6612. In today's lecture, we're gonna talk about overdispersion and count data. And in particular, we're gonna talk about different models for handling um, overdispersion. Uh, we're gonna focus on quasi-Poisson regression, but also briefly mention negative binomial regression. And um, some of the readings from this come from this book that I mentioned in the last lecture, Beyond Multiple Linear Regression. Uh, where they have a section on overdispersion that I find to be quite helpful. Um, so, what is overdispersion? Well, when we model counts or proportions, we typically use models that require a certain relationship between the mean and the variance, which can be derived from the exponential family form of the distribution. For the binomial model, uh, the mean is NP number of trials times the probability that y equals 1, and the variance is given here. In Poisson models, the mean, which we call lambda, is equal to the variance. And overdispersion occurs when the observed variability in the outcome is greater than that that is predicted by the model. Underdispersion can also occur, uh, but in practice, practice this is less common. So as implied by the name, overdispersion generally involves that the assumed variance structure is inconsistent um, with the actual variance of the underlying data. Um, and so when you do have overdispersion in the GLM framework, the beta hats are generally still unbiased, um, meaning the estimate is still, uh, is still good. However, the estimates of the standard errors may be very biased. And as a result of that bias and the standard errors, hypothesis, hypothesis tests can be anti-conservative, meaning that they reject the null more often than they should, and confidence intervals will be artificially narrow. So basically, your results, your inference, may look better um, and more significant than it should be if you have overdispersion that's not accounted for in your analysis. And for underdispersion, these results are going to be in the opposite direction, where you have wider confidence intervals than you should, and you're less likely to uh, reject the null hypothesis. So there are actually several methods that have been developed to handle overdispersion. The simplest one, and the one that we're going to focus on the most today, is estimating a scale parameter in what's called quasi-Poisson regression. Another uh, popular framework for handling overdispersion is using negative binomial modeling. And then you can also use uh, generalized estimating equations or random effects models. And these are uh, both models for handling correlated longitudinal data. I'm not going to talk about them in the context of overdispersion, but we are going to talk about these um, in subsequent lectures this semester. And all of these methods can be implemented in R. So modeling the scale par parameter. The simplest way to account for dispersion is to use a dispersion factor to inflate the standard errors that are given from regular Poisson regression. So from lecture 1.2 um, and the exponential family form, we have, uh, if you have a y distributed, a, y, a variable y that has, comes from exponential family distribution and you put it in exponential fam family form, you can get the variance uh, by this equation. Um, for Poisson regression, that a of phi term is equal to 1, and the b prime of theta term is equal to lambda, which is the parameter that's also the expectation, or the mean. For binomial regression, um, you also have that a of phi term equals to 1, but your variance is going to be um, p times 1 minus p. So for, for Poisson, the variance is exactly equal to the mean in the modeling framework. And for the binomial, you don't have an extra parameter. Uh, like the, the variance will be related to the probability, but it's not exactly equal to the probability. And when we want to model a scale parameter, we relax the GLM assumption um, above that a, equals, a of phi equals 1. 
and instead assume that a of phi equals some parameter phi that you will then have to estimate. And then your ex updated expectation and, and variance for your Poisson model becomes what's given here, so where you still have the same mean of lambda, but now your variance is going to be some parameter phi times lambda. And so this doesn't actually impact the estimation of the regression parameters, the beta values. It's only going to impact the standard errors. And so we can actually estimate that dispersion parameter v by dividing the model. So by calculating a Poisson regression model and then dividing the model deviance, which is the, or the model residuals, um, by its corresponding degrees of freedom in the model, where the deviance is calculated by uh, the numerator of this equation, which is the sum over all observations of the observation itself minus the expected value of the observation given by the model uh, squared. And then the uh, denominator is given by the degrees of freedom, which you calculate by n, the total number of observations minus p, the number of parameters being estimated in the model. Now I'll give you an estimate of the dispersion factor, phi. And when you do this, this is called a quasi-Poisson regression model, since it's close to Poisson, but you're multiplying the variances by this phi term, and this is an ad hoc solution. I've provided a table here that kind of gives you the difference between Poisson and quasi-Poisson. So your estimates, your betas, are going to be the same. Um, the standard errors um, will be, um, you for the quasi-Poisson, you take the standard errors uh, from the Poisson model and you multiply by the square root of the estimated phi term. And then you can get walled type test statistics using, um, in the Poisson framework, you get its beta hat divided by the standard error of beta hat to get the test statistic. And that follows a standard normal distribution, which is indicated by Z. But if you're doing quasi-Poisson, then you divide your beta hats by the new standard errors that you calculated here. And this will no longer follow a standard normal distribution. This actually follows a T distribution. So you have to treat it a little bit differently. Um, so then to get your confidence intervals, you would um, take your estimates and then add or subtract um, your Z to statistic times the standard errors. Or if you're using quasi-Poisson, you have to uh, multiply by the t statistic because you're using a t distribution now instead of a z distribution. And I'm not going to go into why Poisson follows a z distribution and quasi-Poisson follows a t distribution, but basically um, what is going on is when you multiply by this new term, you don't have the same asymptotic properties that you would when you're using a Poisson model. So the distribution that the test statistic follows um, when sample size gets large is going to be slightly different. So we're going to go through uh, an example from chapter 4.4 of the book I referenced at the beginning of this lecture. And this example is about crime rates on college and university campus campuses. Uh, and it's a real data set where also all post-secondary institutions are required by law to collect and report data on crime occurring on campus to the Department of Education. And this data is publicly available on the website of the Office of Post-Secondary Education. For this example, we're interested in looking at whether there are regional differences in violent crime on campus controlling for differences in the type of school. So the outcome variable is not NV, so number of violent crimes. This is the number of violent crimes for that institution for a given year. Um, enrollment is the total enrollment at the school. Um, type is what type of college, this is binary, it can be either 
uh, college indicated by C or university indicated by U. And then um, that's one of the covariates of interest. Another covariate of interest is region. What region of the country um, is the school part of? And then this en enroll 1,000 variable is the enrollment at the school in thousands. And we can use this as an offset to um, calculate the nonviolent, the rate of nonviolent crime in terms of thousands of students at the school. So I have some code below that um, loads the data and recognizes the and recategorizes the region variable. So the data is coming from the GitHub. So that that book that I just mentioned actually is entirely open source and is written in our markdown and is available on GitHub. So I am um, loading their data for that this crime data directly from their GitHub um, re repository using the read underscore CSV function and calling that data set college crime. And then um, I'm doing a little bit of editing the data. I'm just doing this because of following what they did in the book, but basically what they're doing is uh, there's one outlier uh, in crime rate that's super high that they're filtering out. And then they're also recategorizing region um, so that are the southwest and southeast region of the United States and combining them to, to just have a, a region called South. And that's because there are low counts in some of the southwest um, um, southwest entries and they're, they're recategorizing so that we don't have um, a potential is issue of zero cells that could cause instability in the way that the data the model is estimated. So first I'm going to do a little bit of exploratory analysis with this data. And the table below, and this is just a truncated table for it, not all of the observations are shown, um, just to make it fit more nicely on, um, on the slide. But the table below shows the mean and variance of the number of counts across different regions and types of universities. The variance is higher than the mean in most cases, indicating that there may be over dispersion in the data. And the code here just uh, actually calculates this table. You take the data set, I'm grouping by type and region. Uh, I'm for, uh, for, across each of those types and regions, I'm calculating the mean and the variance of the number of violent crimes and also the sample size within that group. And then I'm just printing, uh, I'm only taking the first five observations for six because I want it to fit more nicely on the slide and then I'm printing it out as a pretty table. But you can see here for most of these regions we have a mean and then we have a variance which is much larger. And so some of this may be offset, this difference in mean and variance may be, may be, uh, go, be different when we calculate the um, when we use the offset term and account for the fact that there are different numbers of students enrolled in these different um, regions and areas at each school. But for now, it looks like the variance is quite a bit higher than the mean. And then plotting similar data, here I have um, the number of violent crimes plotted as box plots. Um, we have each of the different regions listed here and or colored by whether you're a college or a university where the colleges in our, are in red and the universities are in blue. And it, it, you can see that um, it appears that regional patterns of rates at universities may differ from that at college, that at colleges like And this also might be something we need to account for in our analysis. So first, um, we, could, we could think about just ignoring potential over dispersion and modeling the crime data using regular Poisson regression. Uh, and so that's what I did with this statement of code here. I'm modeling the outcome nonviolent crime um, I'm using uh, type and region as covariates of interest, and I'm adding an offset term 
for um, enrollment per 1,000 people to account for the fact that there's different enrollment levels at different universities in this data set. And then I also print the table of coefficients below here. And you can see that most of the coefficients are actually significant. And I'm just going to interpret this one here, the region. And this is the, for the northwest re, northeast region, and it's being compared to the central region because the central region is the um, reference uh, variable. And the interpretation of this coefficient is uh, that the violent crime rate per 1,000 students in the northeast is 2.18 times that of the central region controlling for type of school. And we get that 2.18 number from exponentiating the beta value there. So our exploratory analysis indicated that regional patterns of crime rates may differ by school type. This should say type, not time. To test this, we can add an interaction term. And here I am adding that term by this multiplier here. And we have um, two levels for type and I believe five levels for region. So we're going to have four different interaction terms um, that are added to the model, which you'll see if you run this piece of code here, which I've commented out. This will just look at the summary of, of this model. You'll have four different coefficients that have to do with the interaction terms. And they're mostly significant. However, um, what we really want to do is be able to um, test all of these different interactions at the same time. Just test whether adding an interaction between type and region um, is beneficial for this model. And we can do that using the same type of likelihood ratio test we've used uh, in previous types of models to explore whether dropping or adding a term significantly changes the model. And so we run this, we, we do test this by running an ANOVA between the model without an interaction term. Um, that would be the reduced model model with an interaction term, which is the full model in this case. And the test is a likelihood ratio test. This produces this table uh, with a highly significant p-value indicating that there is significant evidence that the difference between colleges and universities and violent crime rate differs by region. So how do we assess over dispersion? We know that the model with the interaction term, we like the model with the interaction term better, better than the model without the interaction term. So we'll keep using the model with the interaction term. I then performed a deviance chi-squared goodness of fit test on the model with the interaction term to see if that model is a good fit to the data. And I ran this model here by calculating the test statistic, which is the deviance for the model. Uh, the rigid, was the deviance compared to the saturated model, and then the degrees of freedom, comparing the uh, degrees of freedom, freedom in the saturated model to the degrees of freedom in our model. And then you can calculate a p-value here. And the p-value is very small, which indicates that this model is actually not a good fit to our data. And why is that the case? Well, it could be that we haven't added enough covariates. However, there aren't really other covariates that we can add. Um, so another possibility is that this is this could be a sign that over dispersion is not accounted, not being accounted for in the data.
So there is one way to assess over dispersion and sort of uh, a, there's a sort of rule of thumb calculation that you can do. Um, and that's to compare the residual deviance of your model to the residual degrees of freedom. And I have that calculated down here, where for our interaction model, I took the deviance from that model and I divided by the degrees of the residual degrees of freedom, and I got a value of 3.95. And this should be about equal to one if there's no dis over dispersion. And greater than one if there is over dispersion. However, in real in practice, we're probably never going to get a value that's equal to one. So as a rule of thumb, people generally say that if this number is greater than 1.5, you have over dispersion. And if it's less than 1.5, you're OK to use your Poisson regression model. And since our factor is actually 3.95, that would be evidence that we do have over dispersion and that we have extra variance not being accounted for by the error structure of our Poisson regression model. So alternatively, we could fit a model to this data using quasi-Poisson regression, as I mentioned earlier. And technically, um, when you fit a quasi-Poisson regression, you're no li lo uh, longer fitting um, data to a, a likely a specific likelihood. You're instead fitting a quasi-likelihood. Uh, and that's part of the reason why your values follow a t-distribution instead of a z-distribution. Um, and also, because you're not fitting a likelihood anymore, um, a your AIC and your BIC uh, will not be valued because these are based on the likelihood. And you'll actually see this when you run uh, po quasi-Poisson regression in R. It gives you an AIC value of zero. So when you run your quasi-Poisson regression, your estimate values, your beta hat terms, will be the same as the Poisson model that you run. However, your standard errors will be different. So if you have over dispersion, your standard errors are going to be um, much greater now. So the code here um, runs that quasi-Poisson regression model. This is exactly the same um, code as when I ran Poisson regression. The only thing that's different is this family statement, where I now have the family equals quasi-Poisson instead of family equals Poisson. And I can extract the dispersion uh, coefficient that's calculated, that's phi hat, as well as the coefficients using these two statements. So here's our phi hat value. Which is estimated to be 4.44. That's much higher than one. So we're going to have much wider confidence intervals than those were calculated by Poisson regression. And because our standard errors are larger, our confidence intervals are wider, which means that it's going to be harder for us to detect a significant result. And you can see from this uh, column of p-values here that now none of our uh, coefficients are significant at the 5% level. And so what if we want to test multiple levels of a covariate or multiple terms in a model simultaneously, like we did when we tested the interaction terms um, a few slides ago? Well, we can still use an LRT-like test. That should say um, and, not and. Where we can still use an LRT-like approach where we look at the ratio of the reduced model to the full model. 
However, we use an FF test rather than a uh, likelihood ratio test because the quasi the ratio of quasi likelihoods follows an F distribution um, rather than a chi square distribution. And we can actually run this test by um, first off, let's we'll run the quasi Poisson regression model um, without the interaction term, and then we compare the one with the interaction term to the one without. And notice here that we say test equals F rather than test equals LRT, and that's because um, this follows an F distribution. And looking at these results, we can see that the um, there's still a significant difference. So even after adjusting for overdispersion, we still have statistically significant evidence that the difference in violent, violent crime rate between colleges and universities differs by region. So finally, I'm going to briefly mention the negative binomial model. The negative binomial model is another approach to dealing with overdispersion. Um, and it uses negative binomial regression rather than Poisson regression. And the way this works is you assume that your data has a negative binomial distribution. Uh, where random where the random variable y has, takes on non-negative integer values so that this can still be considered like a count. However, uh, now we have two parameters, this r and p, that, are, that parameterize that distribution. So it's going to be more flexible, meaning that it's going to be easier to account for vari different variances. Um, and why is the number of failures between the R success in a series of Bernoulli trials? This is highly related to the Bernoulli distribution, just so you know. Um, and because we're using an explicit distribution here, unlike uh, quasi-Poisson regression, uh, we ex assume an explicit likelihood, so things like AIC are still valid. Um, however, I'm not going to go into details about how to actually do a negative binomial regression. It's just good to know about in case you're encountering um, some overdispersed count data someday and you want to try a couple different approaches to dealing with that dispersion. And you can fit a negative binomial model in R using um, the glm.nb function from the mass library.